Yeah, so I'm one of the gang of four that uh, Bob hired on the faculty here with uh, Xenia, Ibrahim, and Jeff. And um, the uh, advantage I had, I didn't have to prepare the symposium, so that was done by Xenia with help of Ibrahim and Jeff and, and others. So thanks uh, to you. So Bob, what a wonderful day when uh, I walked over here this morning with uh, Luz, Masha, and Miles. We came by these wonderful trees, and um, the sun was shining, and the um, blue sky. You have chosen a great location. So that was a good start, but um, I was afraid what was coming. I knew that I was be talking, would be talking last. And uh, as usual, at such an occasion, everything that can be possibly said, has been said by then, but not yet by me. Um, on the other hand, it's also an advantage because you can listen to all the other people and make comments. So you all remember that his brother, Jim, made the remark that after shoveling coal in Buffalo Steel, he came back looking like a chunk of coal and ever, maybe because of this, he's thinking of himself as a big chunk, he said, right? Uh, uh, not chunk, hunk, a uh, big hunk. So I, uh, I looked this up, but I found this cannot be true. Because Big Hunk was produced by Annabelle Candy Company starting in the 50s. But Bob was produced in the in '48, so um, so your brother got something wrong there. Um, so that was um, interesting. So I learned about the Annabelle Candy Company, who were then bought by someone else. Anyway, so um, this um, um, this is about Bob and nonlinear optics. Um, so I. I think he's probably not doing nonlinear optics only because of the people he's meeting, but probably also because of the magic and fascination of the field, maybe the, the two. You, you have seen this picture of him, uh, which you can find in the internet several times already, but you have never seen the light source, so this is it. So, uh, happy anniversary, Bob. This is 70th, but as we discussed the other day, there's another anniversary. It's exactly 33 years that we know each other. Uh, in 1985, it was that uh, I visited uh, Bob in his lab in Rochester for the first time. So we've known each other for a long time, and um, in the last uh, maybe seven, eight years, we've been collaborating more closely. So. Um, <coughs> He has published many papers, not so many books, but a remarkably uh, large number of books. I will not show you all the books. This is the famous book that you have seen. Uh, but there are also other books. And uh, I found it interesting that um, his son, John, was uh, making that remark um, that um, Bob was always explaining about the beaver, who is the mascot of uh, MIT, and that the, uh, the students are the animals. And uh, so look at one of his other books, Robert Boyd, a different kind of animal. Um, but I, I will concentrate on the, on, on, on the left um, book. And my plan for today is, out of the wide spectrum of Bob's work, pick uh, two topics which were of particular importance uh, for me. I knew it. It's only one eye in importance. Okay. Um, and at the end, I will share a few more pictures. So the first topic is time reversal, reversal of spontaneous emission of an atom. Uh, Nader already mentioned the interesting aspect of uh, time reversal and the beautiful work by uh, Matthias Fink in Paris, for example. Um, and so we started to think about this also uh, sometime between 90 and 2000. Um, so uh, this is time reversal of spontaneous emission. So on the left here you see uh, this uh, depicts an atom emitting a photon, photon spontaneously. Basically this goes in all 
uh, directions in 3D. And reversal would be that you send this photon in a time reverse fashion back onto itself. So this is an experiment that we are doing at the moment, as you know. Um, it's not so easy, so it takes a while. Um, this is this deep parabolic mirror. This is this uh, radially polarized donut mode that we um, use to uh, excite the ion or in reverse when it's emitting. It will be like a single photon headlight um, emitting such a ring-shaped um, radial polarization beam. Um, and uh, time reversal has to do with uh, phase conjugation and uh, um, um, Alex Gaita was um, talking about phase conjugation a bit. And um, so I was thinking, maybe not all of you have seen the magic of phase conjugation, so I was searching in the internet whether I could find a nice video, and I found one, but at first I, it, was, it was not easy. So I asked uh, Lambert for help, and it was not easy to find the author. Only at the end of the video it said T. WH, and I thought, gee whiz, this is the acronym of uh, Ted Hench. So um, uh, then we looked a bit more, and we found evidence in the internet. Yes, this uh, this movie was done by him. So I, ah, sorry. This doesn't give me a preview. I'm ahead of myself. Um, I, this is just to show that a photon emitted by an atom will have an exponential tail, and you find this by repeating the experiment many times and doing time resolved detection and spectrally resolved detection. And between the two of them, the only sensible solution is that the photon is emitted as an exponential uh, wave packet with the battery is gone. Okay. Um, and this is weak, so an exponential uh, shape. But, and then time reversal would, of course, mean to, to, re, um, to take the reversal, to do the reversal of this um, wave packet. Um, so um, I, it will be a while until Ted Hench appears. OK, I see. I want to be a bit faster, it seems. So um, if a single atom is emitting a photon inside this deep parabolic mirror, this is like this single photon headlight, you might think uh, maybe you can, by building a sec second apparatus the same way, you can then catch the photon and have uh, full absorption. Uh, is this possible? Answer is no. You only get the probability of at most uh, 0 0.54. Uh, and this is because you're not time reversing. Um, but time reversal is related to phase conjugation. And um, so the question could be if uh, you have first um, mm -hmm. photon emitted and then being collimated by the parabolic mirror going to a universal phase conjugate mirror then coming back will you then have 100% um, absorption and so you have to look into phase conjugation and now I hope yes so here's Ted Hench uh, so I wrote to him uh, yesterday and told him that uh, Bob has his uh, 70th birthday anniversary and he said, can it be that he is uh, so young? Um, and I said, yes. And he said, tell Bob happy birthday from me. And I have authorization to show this uh, video. OK. Now, the thing is, I was not allowed to use my own computer to save time, which means that I now have to close this presentation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you do this, maybe that's no. a bit quicker. We're just going to make sure that's ready to go. So hmm. here's the movie by Ted Hench, self-pumped. Hmm. Oh, I still have to talk. Okay. So um, thank you. So there, are the normal mirrors on the um, on the left. That was a bit fast. Maybe maybe I'll go back. I let's see. I stop. Does that work? I have to drag it. Yeah. Okay. Why does it not go? Okay. Okay.
and our stuff. Okay, so on the of the left side you see a regular mirror. So the the trick, all the trick about this face conjugate mirrors was, um, uh, as most of you know, that if you have an incoming light beam, uh, put it on a mirror that will be nicely reflected. But if there is a frosted glass plate in between, it will scatter the light. And if then the scattered light hits the mirror, it will be scattered back in all kinds of directions, and so it will go um, all over the place, but not back in the direction where it came from. And the face conjugate mirror, the special thing is that if you have on the right side, if the light comes in through this frost glass plate that scatters the light, and it hits the face conjugate mirror at various angles, and the face conjugate mirror, each of these arrows, it sends back exactly into itself, and because it hits the, um, uh, the frosted glass plate at exactly the same position, it retraces itself and it goes exactly back into itself. So this is really magic. I've first uh, seen this, I think, in the lab of Jack uh, Feinberg in the 80s. And Ted Hensch was in his, he has this private lab down in Munich. Uh, apparently he redid this experiment and took a video only three years ago because it's so much uh, fun. Okay, so let's uh, run it now. So this is a quotation from Jack Feinberg. 82 it was, yeah. Um, so this gave hope to use uh, face conjugation in all kinds of applications. So here's the demonstration. So this is a uh, expand a laser beam and a um, a uh, diaphragm which is cut to show the picture of looks a little bit like Abbe um, and then with a the lens it is inverted and there's a focus this you need the focus for the uh, for the face conjured mirror so if you okay so now uh, you have this uh, um, semi-transparent plate, the illumination is from the right, now the frosted glass is put in between, of course the back reflection disappears, now when you take the glass away the back reflection comes back. So now when instead of using a regular mirror you use this barium titanate crystal then it takes a while to form the answer to form the proper, to give the reflection, so you see the face. And soon Ted Hench's hands will come to put the frosted glass plate down. The picture disappears, but you already notice there's a slow time constant of the barren titanate crystal, and long behold, after a while, or maybe not, Maybe we have to wait a bit longer. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay, there it comes. So this is the time scale, very human time scale. So despite, so it goes through this frosted glass, glass plate uh, to that uh, barium titanate and comes back. So this is really nice and magic, and it works not only with that face but also with a. You can also use a cat. So I'm not sure why. Ted Hench then did it also with a cat, so I have not heard him talk about this, so this I cannot tell you, but it works with whatever you, uh, you do. Okay, so that's it. Now we switch back. Um, let me see. Yeah. Uh -huh. well, that works. Okay. And then, where is it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, here. Oh, yes, you yeah. found it. Okay, I found it. Okay, so, okay, so then, now the next question is when you really want to use phase conjugation in connection with quantum optics experiments, like uh, a s spontaneous emission of a single atom, and do time reversal, the question is, what is the quantum property of phase conjugation? And I have always admired Bob for being, I think, the first to look into the quantum properties of phase conjugation. As, uh, as far as I know, I've f found nothing else in the, um, in the literature. So that is 1988. This was uh, a first paper of a series, and Alex Geta mentioned a few of these papers that he was uh, involved in. And... Um, 
the thing is that when you describe um, phase conjugation uh, in uh, with quantum optics, basically you do kind of a Bogolyubov transformation. Um, I think these are new batteries now. Yeah. So then. Um, the output um, beam is described by the input beam with a factor in front which gives a reflection coefficient that can be larger than one, so it can be ampl an amplifying phase conjugating mirror or it can be lower than one. And then there is this other second mode and that gives rise to noise. Um, so there's a noise penalty similar to that of an amplifier. So that shows you that this experiment um, um, does not work so easily. So the reason is the phase conjugation is not a unitary operation and uh, that's why it does not come when you do it, it does not come uh, free of noise. So this question, would this uh, universal phase conjugate mirror give you 100% absorption? The answer is no, because of this quantum noise which was first described by uh, Bob and Alex. Um, however, if you send in an artificially prepared time reversed um, um, uh, spontaneously emitted wave packet. The spontaneous emission has an exponentially uh, uh, tail which is uh, falling off exponentially. Time reversal means you have, an, have to have an exponentially rising uh, slope. And if you send this in, this will be all absorbed at one moment in time. The atom, the single atom here, will be in uh, in the excited state, and then we'll start re-emitting. So what you will get out is the normal exponentially falling uh, tail. So this, in this case, without any noise, you produce the time reversal. Um, a symmetric version of the input beam, but this is not universal. Um, uh, so the atom creates the time reverse version, but only in this very particular case. You send any other light field in, it doesn't uh, do that. So Bob's paper gave us a lot of insight, us meaning um, my PhD students Martin Fischer, um, Lucas Alba, and uh, yeah, these are two PhD students. Postdoc is Bharat uh, Srivatsan, and um, Markus Weber was a visiting scientist, and Markus Sondermann is the group leader. Okay, second topic is uh, wave mixing in an unusual geometry, um, and there you can we could learn from uh, uh, Bob's book. That's why I show it here again. This is a picture from Bob's book. So if you have a focused light beam, somehow. I have to be careful not to press too hard. So, okay. So this is the confocal parameter. If the nonlinear crystal is much smaller than the confocal parameter, you're basically in the paraxial regime, whereas if the crystal is larger than the confocal parameter, or you can take the same crystal and focus more tightly, then you are in the tight focusing regime. And uh, then the phase matching uh, condition that uh, um, Masha was uh, describing th just in the previous uh, talk, which is the symmetric uh, um, sync function, um, becomes uh, asymmetric. You find all these interesting things in the book. Um, okay. And um, so, um, and in order um, to, to understand the behavior, uh, it is important to understand a GUI phase shift. And there is, so Bob was not the first one to explain the GUI phase shift. This was GUI probably <laughs> 80 years earlier. But he was maybe the first one to give an intuitive explanation, and I think this paper is cited more than 100 times, um, so uh, it's worth reading at this. And in a nutshell, I think the story is if you have geometric optics, you have rays coming in and going to a mathematical point and emerging again, it would just be these straight lines. And, but in reality, the light is going a different way and the pass is a bit slower. And it was this, um, Bob kind of recovers um, part of the uh, formula um, that you otherwise get in a rigorous treatment, but which doesn't give you so much insight. So this is very nice and helpful. Um, then when doing nonlinear optics in this uh, 
a tight focusing regime, uh, he found some anomalies, so they were also called anomalies in the paper, was uh, Michel Malquit. Um, and so then, since we have this deep parabolic mirror from the previous experiment, we were thinking, ah, we can use this also to look at uh, um, nonlinear optics. And basically here, this is paraxial, the paraxial regime. This is tight focusing. But then you can go even beyond this. So this is tight focusing that you can get with a very fast lens. But if you really want to go in from all directions, you have to do something else, maybe something like with this uh, deep parabolic mirror or some other more involved experimental trick. Um, so this is now a manuscript that we have out. It's not published yet. Nonlinear optics with full three-dimensional illumination. This is the, I don't want to go into the detail, but this is the setup. Um, the student, Rojar, was visiting Ottawa last year and reported about the status of the experiment at the time, but uh, this time she couldn't come. Um, and um, so this is how small the focus can be in all three directions when you uh, focus light from all, uh, from all uh, possible solid angles. This is the archive paper. So this is in now what we have done. We have mode. If we have varied the solid angle. We can go almost to the full four pi solid angle, maybe 0.9 um, of the full pi four pi solid angle. Not not quite. Uh, so here's one. Uh, but we of course can can kind of um, uh, block off part of it, and, and we can look at always the same power, how does the third harmonic generation we were looking for, third harmonic generation in argon, how does it change as we, for a given focused power, so we always adjust the power to be um, the same, uh, as a function of um, a solid angle, how does it change, and this is how it should be uh, theoretically the black curve. What we see is this here, which means that our parabolic mirror is not ideal. We are, eventually we are hoping we have some reason to believe that maybe there's some deviation from the prediction of uh, normal um, um, uh, diffraction limited uh, focusing and uh, but uh, that remains to be seen so we will we are looking forward to the how this develops so at the moment uh, this is the this is the curve um, that we see experimentally, which is a result of still some aberrations um, that we have, which are a bit tricky in this very deep parabolic mirror. Okay, so I'm coming uh, close to the end. So my joint um, adventure with uh, Bob is this Max Planck Center. Many of you are part of this. The Max Planck U Ottawa Center for Extreme and Quantum Photonics was mentioned several times. 2015, it was signed. Uh, Ferdi Schut, Vice President of Max Planck, uh, five weeks ago he fell off uh, a mountain uh, on a mountaineering trip, but was lucky. After several surgeries, he was writing SMS again. So he was on a on a he was uh, had to be carried on a rope in a in some some structure, some bed, on hanging on a rope of a helicopter. He was uh, eventually transported back to the. Uh, to the valley that was recently in 2015 he looked uh, um, quite fit and we hope he will be like this again and um, this is the previous president and previous uh, vice president of research this was a picture of the time with uh, Bob and myself and um, then this, uh, this center gave us a great opportunity to collaborate and we have many joint um, uh, joint projects and I think the good thing between uh, the people here at the center and back home at my institute is that we have some overlap but not complete overlap so partially complementary partially overlapping and I think this is a good uh, this is a good um, basis for a fruitful uh, collaboration and since this Max Planck is kind of like a German institution whenever there's some delegation from Germany coming um, people tend to stop by, so um, President, the former federal president of, of uh, Germany, um, Joachim Gauck, uh, was here. Um, that was that was even in 2014, I think. This was before this center. 
it was slightly before the center came, but before we had some, some precursor, some international Max Planck partnership. Um, and now only, was it two weeks ago, 10 days ago, um, there was a new delegation with the uh, new uh, Minister for Education and Research uh, from Germany um, and members of German Parliament joining her. In addition, you can see uh, Jean-Michel Ménard, uh, Paul Kockum, Paul Boyd, André Staude um, from here. So I think everybody who could speak German, like André Staude and also Jean-Michel Ménard, although you may not think he speaks German, but he speaks German quite well, so that um, the minister could understand. And then uh, Gloria gave me the pictures that were officially taken, and one of them I wanted to share with you. Oops, no, okay, this is just highlighting Bob again. And one of the other pictures I was wanted to share with you is Bob's discussion with the minister. And you know, this is a still picture. What do you think did they talk about? So I can tell you, so Bob was saying, you do not understand. <laughs> I have seen that before. And then the answer was, well, you know, I was not a science major, which is, hmm? Yes. <laughs> she is not a science major. <laughs> well, sometimes the jokes are the, jokes are the truth. Okay, so thank you, Bob, for being such a wonderful colleague and friend, and uh, it's just wonderful to be um, part of the group here. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Gerd, and if there are any, yes, Zahir, please. <laughs> Yes, uh, Zakir has a question. Uh, so I have two stupid questions. Uh, so the first one is that the more stupid one first. <laughs> so, the most stupid one is this one. so you know how you have a resin set action. Uh, so in one way you can draw the line two lines. You can show the things like this and the bands of the bands around the side of the other so if I look at the picture, all the interactions You mean the energy flow into the other yeah. yeah. so, so all the interactions become the non interactions So it's white mass. It seems like all the interactions are non interactions in that picture. That correct. Yes, in a way. Okay. Um, I don't need any point that you can do yeah, so um, th that's right, but this is only light that is very close to the atom does that. Uh, so light that is at a distance of the atom, which, uh, uh, which is in, the, in an area less than a wavelength where one has this so-called um, um, evanescent non-propagating field. And um, so this is the reason why the absorption cross-section of an atom for light is typically of the order of lambda squared, and not the, not the actual diameter of the region where the charges are, which is many orders of magnitude smaller. Sometimes people wonder, how can an atom have such a large cross-section when you look at the absorption cross-section for light? And that's exactly that reason. When it comes so close to the atom, everything is kind of sucked up. So if somehow you can increase the cross-section, like what you were mentioning, so then the interaction becomes and all of this becomes a non-fraction. Yeah, if if you go outside that region, re region, oh, okay. So if if you have a single if you have a single atom, this paraxial does not maybe does not have so much meaning because paraxial usually refers if you have some propagation and you have an ensemble and some 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 uh, length. Uh, so paraxial is probably an uh, uh, wrong word, but uh, you, you could, I mean, under, understanding this dynamics, you could think of how, what would I need to do to increase the absorption even further, that's right. For example, you put the atom in a medium where the wavelength is longer, yeah, right. Second question. Second question, is that decay, what decay 
that we know the, the field we showed was the exponential decay. So it's exponential decay. On the other side, we also have spectral heat, where the Lorentz dimension uh, of the story. So we know that. So the so the Röntgen uh, uh, line shape is the um, is basically I think is it the absolute square of the Fourier transform. So this Lorentzian line shape you have for an exponentially decaying function, for exponentially growing function, or if you have a function which is both exponentially growing and decaying in in the frequency spectrum, if you if you just look at it without looking at the phases, if you only look at the amplitudes, which you usually do when you use a power, if you measure the power spectrum, then you don't see that difference. But when you think about whether this is the right wave packet, which is like time reversed to the previous wave packet, you have to look at the phase two, which you don't do if you just measure the power spectrum. Maybe this is a little bit the question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much, and uh, in conclusion, I would like to invite uh, Robert Boyds himself to um, uh, give some remarks about his present program.